This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. The following podcast may contain naughty, naughty language. If you're easily offended, please do not listen or, you know, just be less offended. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat under roast whenever I want to eat under roast, not when you want me to eat it. I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers! <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And you would bend down to pick it up and then he'd fart in your face. He thought that was very, very funny. I don't mind a bit of gangster rap if I'm driving around talking, giving it to some, you know. The guy said to me, the waiter, do you want to come and see the kitchen? I said, no, not really, mate. I've seen one kitchen, I've seen them all. Like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Welcome to Grilled, a podcast by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen. And once again, my co-host is Michael O'Hare. Always a pleasure, Michael. Thank you. How are we? Yeah, good. Sun is shining. I'm happy today. So, yeah. Sun is shining and um, I am like gagging, like genuinely gagging for a tan. I feel anemic. I used to like cane the sunbeds. I know it's not healthy. I'm not advocating it. But pre-lockdown, I was like 20 minute a session. And I even had this, um, sorry, you don't need this level of information, but I'm going to give you it anyway. I like the lie down ones because it makes me feel like I'm on holiday. But yeah. because I've got like a bit of junk in my trunk, when, um, when my ass cheeks like squish together on the sunbed, they create a gap. So I have this like white bit at the top of my ass, which looks like a tooth, like a molar or something. That just <laughs> But the, the, the recent lockdown has given me a fresh start as a tan base, and I'm going to be going stand up and like arching a little bit into it. There you go. You didn't need to know that, did you? Let's introduce our guest uh, today. Uh, Michael. Um, she's she's worked at uh, Pennell's, The Wilderness and Albright. Um, she has, uh, she's an inspiring young chef. She has 1.5 million followers on TikTok. And I think it's fair to say you have a bit of an obsession with potatoes. I think that's allowed. I think I can say that. So, uh, Michael, um, we have got Poppy O'Toole. Why did you want uh, Poppy as one of your guests on the podcast? No, I am. Um, I wanted Poppy as one of my guests. Actually, I think it's probably fair to say that this was uh, more Poppy's idea than mine. But, um, you know, elephant in the room. We did a previous podcast where um, your name came up and I was introduced uh, to you, the story of you, like for the first time. Yeah. And there was some kind of negative connotations between that that have since forced a conversation about uh, misogyny, feminism and the struggles of kind of the female's position within um, I guess, whole cuisine or gastronomy in general. Um, and I think once, once, like, I guess let's call it an argument, fuck it. Once an <laughs> argument starts, it's quite a nice kind of jumping point to say, right, okay, well, this is a good point to have the conversation. Like, we can turn this negative thing into a really positive thing. Um, and I, you're, for, uh, excuse me on this one, but you're from a world, like I said, in the last conversation that is completely new to me. I had no idea the interest in food from a social perspective was so absolutely uh, enormous. And my audience has always been like a a small target audience for the restaurant, whereas yours is like completely global. And I think it's fair to say you're in a very shit year. You're like a a real success story from that, right? Like, I mean, it has gone turbo, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's when, that's why I don't really want as, as much as you say it kind of is an argument, it's not me trying to have an argument. And that's um, one thing that I would like to just put across, but it's, it's, it has been a massive year for me and it has been a really successful year for me, probably one of the best years of my career. Um, and it's the, the kind of, what am I trying to say? It's the disregard for it, I think, is what brought along this argument and how it, it, it comes across as misogynistic like we said it is it's something that is in the industry but yeah I've had a going on to nice things I had an amazing year like I'm sat here with um a book deal which I never would have got if I'd can you know been working um I never never would have had an opportunity to get to where I am today because I would have been very concentrated on just being at work so it's incredible can I um can I ask you a question on the book situation because I'm, I'm also at a point where I've almost like well, I've pretty much finished the book and it has been, for me, one of the least enjoyable things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> uh, g- genuinely, it's been like horrendous and only because of my own kind of insecurities and 
I don't know, I guess fear of being dated or anything. And I found the, sorry, this is just pure yeah. projection of my opinion, but I found <laughs> that like what, what I'm doing now, I'm almost terrified that it's going to date. So in the restaurant, you know, there's an impermanence to food that it's gone and it's fine and you can change it and you can evolve. But when you, and that's the beauty, I guess, of the art of gastronomy is it's just for now and then it's gone. But with a book, you're like putting out and you're saying, all right, guys, this is probably going to still exist in 10 years and my opinions will probably change and my food will probably change. And I have just been terrified the whole fucking thing. And it's taken me about two years <laughs> to get it right. How's that process been for you? Is it being enjoyable? Has it been, you know, have you taken any negatives from it or is it all positive? Uh, for me, it has mainly been positive. Like the thing is, is there's, we're going down two very different avenues. I am doing something that is... I've seen what my audience kind of want and that's kind of how I've developed this book. It's not a book that is, um, you know, obviously I don't have a restaurant. I don't have a name to myself. I don't have anything to kind of sh showcase really. All I have is um, a following and people who want to learn. And it's definitely the younger generation that are involved in what I'm doing. So my, my passion at the minute and my book that I'm trying to do is actually just just teaching people and building confidence in the kitchen and people what I've realized is that they don't necessarily even know how to make a tomato sauce which is one of the videos that did really well for me which is something that you I people in the industry would take for granted just knowing that that's you know that you can just whip that up instead of buying a jar so mine is very much based around teaching and confidence within the kitchen and just the basics for people um which has been really difficult because I've been adding more and more things in and wanting to make it more extravagant and more. And then uh, the publishers have been like, you need to pull it back. This is like an educational tool more than like your personality on a, on a plate. So it's been, it's been an interesting one to work on and it's been really, really exciting and really good. But yeah, again, just, just trying to open up dining and, and cooking to um, the young generations for, for me in this, in my book but it's um very exciting and we're almost finished and we've got one more half of the photo shoot to do so that's all coming up excellent when you say um the younger generation do you have any idea kind of what demographic that is as a rough age range yeah so i mom it's like millennials and gen z that are kind of my massive audience <laughs> and so my generation so millennials are in there and then I think I don't actually ever know what Gen Z dates are, but it's you know I think from about they're about they're in the teens now. Okay, so th this this is potentially people that are still living at home with the parents then. Yeah, that's quite a nice thing, isn't it? Because um, I didn't. The reason I'm a chef is because it, like the opposite of that, I guess. I hadn't not been able to cook. I was always allowed to if I wanted to, but I'd never shown an interest in it. And I was kind of like. I'm an only child. I was a little bit mollycoddled, if I'm honest, a little bit spoiled. And I was just mm -hmm. always catered for. And then when I went away to university, that's the first time I had to actually cook for myself. Um, and then I was like, fuck, this is so much better than engineering. And, and that's like how I, <laughs> <laughs> how I fell into it. And it's quite nice if you can, if you can attack that from even a younger age. Um, yeah. So that people have got, you know, if I had, fuck man, if I'd have been able to start cooking when I was like 13 rather than 21, um, I'd have probably been notably better, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> Poppy, yeah. when did you realise that what you were doing on on TikTok was taking off? Like, when did you have that kind of, hang on a minute, I'm really enjoying this, but actually now it's becoming a, a, a thing for me? It was getting the messages, I think, actually. I was getting reached out to by um, young people, young aspiring chefs, just being like, you're inspiring me to get in the kitchen, to do this. I love... Um, that you've turned around this year and that you know you're putting stuff out there that isn't scary in any way uh none of it's a threatening not threatening but it's not um there's no elitism to it there's no judgment there's no nothing to the way that I'm cooking I'm doing stuff that people can just do at home and it's coming from someone with a professional background um rather than you know just showing off my food it's just it's just getting people interested in it and that's when I started to realise that I might be able to make an impact here and I might be able to carry on a career um, in a different path than I probably would have before through social media and through helping people in any way that I could. This year I was like, I was so like, what on earth am I meant to do? I can't, I 
can't help anyone. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to be able to do anything in this situation. I've just been told that, you know, ta have a nice one. You know, lovely knowing you um, before furlough was a thing. So it was a bit like, oh, I've worked for 10 years. I've been doing my 70 hours. I've been doing all this. Like a lot of chefs that are in the same position that have happened in all their places have closed and stuff, which has been terrible for everyone. And I just thought, you know what? Let's just do something. I'm going to be cooking at home anyway. Let's just video it. And it's so I'm just very lucky, very fortunate to be in this position now. And obviously a million, well, 1.5 million followers. That's that's amazing. Like you must be like, that's that's not what I thought was going to happen. I think that's, that's roughly a quarter of Sweden. Just... <laughs> 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 I'm, sure it's not. I'm sure it's there's more British people. I don't understand what they're all saying. No, it's um yeah, so much bigger than I ever expected it to be. And I don't I I wanna say I don't know why, but I'm hoping it's because they enjoy what I'm doing and they enjoy the way that I'm cooking and and enjoy the personality that I am you know, trying to bring these people into um my kitchen, I suppose. But it's just so, so much bigger than would ever I could ever imagine. I was excited when I got like 10 followers. So now it's like, it's just stupid, but incredible. How are you, how are you dealing with that personally? Because obviously that's a, like a great thing, but there must come with that a huge amount of pressure that you weren't anticipating. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's, it can be a bit nerve wracking, um, putting yourself out there for that many people to judge. And this is another thing that kind of, comes into the conversation that we're going to have today about uh, misogyny and about things that happen in in the industry as well it's you put yourself out there for criticism and you know I'm willing to do that because I'm hoping that the people behind me who want to do this can do that without as much of it and as much judgment towards them so <laughs> Shall we? Shall we? Um, shall we go straight into into this conversation? Because I I think it's quite a long one, isn't it? Potentially, and I'd I'd just like to start with it if I could. Um, so, uh, Cara, sorry, I'm going to repeat myself here. We had a conversation just before you came on, Poppy. Um, yeah. And if I'd like, if it's okay, I'd like to put forward my own, um, I guess, my own unintentional sexism, and just give you a little bit of a backstory on me. Um, so I'm, I turned 40 in June and I'm using that point as um, a kind of line in the sand where I want to be at a point where I'm happy with myself personally, mentally, physically, creatively. I want to be like, sit back and be like, fucking hell, this is good. And part of that is working on myself as a person and working on any problems that I've had. And feminism is something that in, if I'm just being completely open, I've been particularly kind of ignorant about um, and I'm aware of that. And I think that the reasoning is because the label of it is something that men, particularly like kind of northern heterosexual men, yeah. will see as like almost the opposite to what you are, you know? Um, I grew up in a household where sexism existed, but yeah. not in the way that you'd think. So um, my mother was the breadwinner. Uh, she had the business. My dad, you know worked at factory, well, he was a welder, but my mum was, um, she had the family business. We had like kind of six florists at one point and she earned like notably the most money. And there's little things that happened within that is that like we'd go out every weekend, I was fortunate, and she would put cash on the bed for my dad to then pick up without saying anything to put in his pocket so that when we went out for dinner, he could pay the bill. Yeah. Which is like, when I look back at it, that is fucking alien, isn't it? But at the time I just took it. Like, I, you know, it's, it's what you kind of grew up with, what you grow around with. And then, like I said, I left Middlesbrough without really seeing or knowing what I considered any form of sexism or racism. I then went to university in London and um, a girl that I lived with at the time, um, Narissa, we were like really good friends. And we were only there like a few weeks and she was like bent over in the fridge and I, I went to like go past her and I just said, oh, sorry, sweetheart. And she turned around and she said, Michael, did you just call me sweetheart? Actually, she was South African. Can I do the accent? <laughs> Go for it. I love a good <laughs> Michael <laughs> accent. <laughs> you call me sweetheart? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, how fucking condescending is that? And I was like, oh, no, it's not at all. 
Like, and I, I almost got like kind of angry by it. And I, I know my prejudices, I know my wrongdoing with this, right? But I was like, angry, it's not fucking, it's not bad because that's the way I was brought up and we call each other sweetheart and we call each other love and flower and darling and things like that. And that's, the intention was, there was no malice there. The intention was positive. But the truth of the matter is, she was offended by it. So it was fucking offensive. Like there's, there's no way, whether you intend it or not, that's not the issue. The issue is the act, isn't it? Um, yeah, and I think that's the position that a lot of, of men and women in fairness are in, is that we don't know the full extent of our conditioning of like the world that we live in and the doctrine that runs kind of deep when you say things like referring to people as animals in a positive or a negative way, you're like kind of dehumanizing people. And it's, um, it's a really interesting subject. And the reason that I think it's a good thing to roll with now is because I think if people are open to this discussion, just to see how it is, I have absolutely no, no idea how it is to be Poppy O'Toole, how it is to be Cara Hochin. I only know myself. So it's quite nice to hear from other people and think, actually, like, I have no idea that I was having this impact on person. Like, and there's definitely a fear, a yeah. fear that runs deep within guys of like, shit, am I gonna be criticized? Because when you're saying to someone, what you're saying is sexist or racist or misogynistic, or anything negative, you then say, technically you're not really quite right as a person and you need to make a change. And it's so easy to be defensive about that and say, I'm not fucking wrong, you know what I mean? And because it's, it's critique, isn't it? It's personal critique, but within professional environments, we take that critique because someone's saying, this is a good way of doing this. You know, as a chef, someone shows you something new, this is a good way of doing this. And I think we need to move to a direction of this is a good way of being. And this is a good way of talking. And that can only be based on other people's kind of um, things that upset others, right? Because if it doesn't upset you, you don't know it's upsetting people. What you're saying is completely like, right, you don't, you don't know. You don't know until something happens. And like you said, we are conditioned. And, you know, I say bab and love and darling. And I do refer to friends and family and people that I know and peers like that. And it's that understanding of who you're talking to and... Um, you know what those relationships are like when those kind of you know those colloquialisms come into it um and i think in reference to where we're going with this is when um gareth does say bird on on the podcast it's not said in a colloquial way it's said in quite an in quite a demeaning degrading way it's not, I'm not trying to personally attack Gareth in any way when I'm talking No, about no, it. I think it's fine. This is the conversation. Right? That's what, there's differences in how you say things and, you know, calling someone that you've known for months bird probably isn't that bad because they know they're on the same level and it's a similar, they're on the same level as you basically. So when you take it out of context and put it into something that you, you know, he's is saying, I don't know who this person is. Um, they've come out of nowhere. They're this, that, and the other. It, it all, all, you know, all rolls into something that can has an underlining of misogyny through it, because we're conditioned to it. It's you, you know, we're used to it. It's not. It's it's this having this conversation is going to open that thought process to people when they're speaking about anyone in the industry, any female, any woman. It might just go, oh, actually. Maybe not. And that's my goal here. My goal isn't to try and take down the patriarchy and, you know, you know, take down all these chefs in the mm. industry who I look up to and are incredible. I'm just trying to make people think a little bit harder before we instantly go to gender or, um, you know, colloquialisms and terms that we're kind of used to using and just thinking, oh, that might seem... A little bit degrading or disrespectful to that person obviously this is something that has come with you having a, a profile and a platform that you obviously yeah. you so I'd like to kind of talk about the, the kind of the start of this before we've got to this point because yeah, a, a yeah. lot of people won't realize the the things that um have been you know things that have been written on your on your Instagram from people that didn't need to write that they I mean they follow they don't even follow you they just purposely are coming to your page to to be to say yeah. things that they don't need to say so before we talk about that I, how do those comments actually make you feel because I think sometimes people don't even think about that do they yeah. so yeah this is coming from like months of kind of having this 
sort of these connotations, this kind of hate for me um, from, I get it from, um, for being an actual influencer, like people don't like social media influencers. I never realized I was going to be one of those people, but here we are um, from being a chef and a female chef at that. And also for just being a female as well. Um, so you kind of get this three way of just people just criticizing you and telling you you're wrong. Um, so when it's, cause it, to begin with, I wasn't getting that. It was all very supportive, very nice. And then kind of went, kind of did a bit of a U-turn and everyone just started to, the more successful you get, the more people that start noticing who you are and following you, you do get these trolls. And I know Michael, you said you've had them before in the past and everything, and it, yeah. it happens. And it's, it may, it's just like, it makes you feel like, what is it that I can do that's going to be right? And I take, you know, I've, I'll, I've taken criticism, like I said, in the kitchen, it's kind of easy because you know you can learn, adapt and build on it. But when it's coming from these people who you have no idea who they are, they're completely anonymous, they're just, I don't even know why people do it. I find it a bit pathetic that people have to say these sort of things, especially when I'm just trying to call out um, people being wrong, basically. Um, why it is that they have a feeling that they have to be so negative towards me? I'm not. It's, it's yeah it's just been it's been a difficult one to try and understand and and they it's always based around my gender which is just odd I don't get I wouldn't you know I wouldn't mind if it was because I was really terrible at my job um and it's always based around me be, be not being a real chef and based around me being no good at what I do but I can kind of take that a little bit more but it's been not being taken seriously as a chef who's had to work for 10 years you know has worked I've worked hard for that for to be able to call myself a chef um and then people still bring it back around to stupid woman dumb bitch um you know just using using my gender as the problem the truth is that like men don't get the same criticism like they get criticism but it's not because they're a man I'm getting it because I am a woman which is just it's just frustrating because it's like I've, I've I'm doing the same things. I'm trying to do the same things. I'm looking up to these people. I'm trying to do what you're doing. Um, and I've just, yeah, it's just because that I've, it's just one of those things. And it makes you feel a bit rubbish and you do have down days, but I'm being able to call it out and just have confidence to be like, I'm going to try and make a little bit of a difference. It does make it feel better. Do you feel that there's, um, there's a parallel with how you're perceived and how you're received and with this, I mean, the misogyny, the negativity in, for want of a better word, the real world, as in face-to-face -face interactions with people, be it in a workplace um, or a social environment, compared to, say, for want of, like the internet kind of keyboard warrior, I'm, I'm safe behind this screen, I can say whatever I want, no one can get me. Um, because I, I've like, I've been called some awful shit and never has anyone come up to me in the street and said, by the way, you fat, ugly cunt. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's all right. We can swear. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard you apologise for swearing before. You know, but I'm, still, like, you know, I'm very nervous. Um, <laughs> not really. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I feel like there's a real disconnect between um, reality and the kind of like bitchiness of like the behind the back thing. And kind of think that it's worse that it's behind the back because it, it you can't answer it it's just there forever and I think with with negativity and I would even go as far to say not even negativity just criticism on any level be about how you look how you dress how you cook your taste what you've said any form of criticism and when it happens like in a social when you can't have that conversation with someone one-on-one -on -one about it there's just no coming back from it. And a hundred people can say something nice or 1.5 million people can say something nice and 1.5 million people can be in your back corner. But if there's five that aren't or one that isn't, you remember the fucking one because yeah. I think we're also conditioned to like kind of just pass praise over a little bit, you know, we're praised and it's like, oh, thank you. Yeah. But then like the negativity is like, ah, shit, what's wrong with me? You know, it's a, devastating you really concentrate on it like I can have hundreds of people being like it's inspiring it's incredible what you do and then one person calls me like a bloody gobshite and that my food's bog standard and I'm like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
really ruined my day. But it, it's just cope. It's just being able to go like these are people behind um, uh, laptops and, and that, and behind their phones, and they wouldn't actually say it to me. But it just when it it comes off the back of years of it in the industry as well. You know, years of of just sexism within the industry. So when it comes from someone who, I mean, I get a lot of criticism from chefs as well, not just, you know, elite chefs and top chefs, but like actual just people. I think one guy who was a head chef in in um, in London just commented on one of my videos when I was just being like, oh, behind, you know, backstage at like doing my photo shoot for my book. I'm so excited. Just a really nice little video. And he was like, well, your food's bog standard. So I don't know why you've got a book. And I was just like, that isn't needed. Why, you know, why, why? It's also especially unusual, I feel, because, you know, it's the audience that you're kind of projecting to. Why is he part of that audience? And Frankie Boyle said once, and I'm paraphrasing, I've got this completely wrong, but he was talking about like kind of his humor, whether you like him or not. Um, mm. And that when he tells it to his audience, people that are going to his shows know who he is and know which direction that comedy is going in. So if it's badly received in that audience, it's a small audience, it's a few thousand people. But if you then hear that joke, think it's funny, and then tell it to someone else and they're offended, yeah. that's your joke, it's not his. Yeah. So like, what I mean with you is that if, if you're cooking, let's say a, a pasta bake, right? And someone watches that and says, well, it's only a fucking pasta bake. Well, why did you tune in to watch someone cook a pasta bake? You know, if, if you're watching like, I don't know, the world's 50 best and the winner is like Carluccio's, kick off then. Cause yeah. that's, you know, that's the audience that you're at there. But I think it's an unusual thing to, to, um, to critique something out of context is what I'd say. Yeah, it's a, I'm, I am going for a different audience than what, you know, what chefs would probably go for usually. I'm just trying, mm. I, people don't, I think cause I put myself out there as a chef and as I've got this background and I've got this training, they're expecting, you know, these high-end dishes, which of course I can whap them out if I really want to, but that's not what people want to see. I'm trying to give people what they want and I get criticized for it and people aren't quite understanding it. But yeah, like you said, if, if it was in the street, I don't think anybody would ever say it to me. I think a similar thing happened when Jamie Oliver like burst onto the scene in that he was super well received by millions, but top chefs like, were negative towards that because there's that, I guess, jealousy, maybe a fear of like, well, I can cook a bit, a bit of fucking rumpa lamb than you can, therefore I deserve this, you don't deserve this. And it's, a, it's an unusual thing, but it definitely happened there. I'm not sure, and I might be wrong, but I don't feel like people like, it's not equal, is it? I don't feel like Nigella Lawson or um, James Martin really suffer this. Do you know what I mean? The, the food that you're cooking isn't a million miles away from, from James Martin or Nigella Lawson. And I, all I see is positivity towards James Martin. And he would be the first person to say, this isn't like fancy restaurant food. Yeah. He'd be the first person to say that, but there's the zero criticism. And I think the reason for that is people see it as an opportunity to benefit for themselves, you know, from a professional perspective, I mean. If I'm really nice to James Martin, then maybe he'll let me on his TV show and people will be nice to me and I'll get more money. And uh, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Look at it, everyone's like, oh, fucking stunning, mate. And it's not, it's like, it's just a plate of food to eat and it's nice, I'm sure. But, you know, I'm not bad mouthing in many ways. It's quite the opposite. I'm talking about people that are deliberately overly nice. Yeah. It's the same subject matter that people are overly mean about, just directed at a different person. I don't know whether that's based on gender or maybe a little bit uh, poppy, no disrespect intended, the length of time that he's been doing it in comparison to you. It, it's kind of incomparable, isn't it? So it's like, there's a, a foundation there, I guess. But yeah, it's an unusual thing. How do you, um, on the subject of kind of equality rather than uh, feminism, mm. obviously the population, and I don't know the exact figures, but let's just go with 50% male and female for argument's mm. sake. Yeah. I have had, um, one female chef at the man behind the curtain full time. In the entire time that I've been open, I've been operating six years. Um, and that's not down to misogyny, or, you know what I mean? That's, it's literally the only person other than someone that was grossly underage that's ever applied underage, not underqualified, like 15 or something. Um, and she was with me for like three years, but there's only one, which is an incredibly small percentage. And I think that's, you know, probably lower than normal, but 
it's definitely reflective of an industry in general. Yeah. I also think it's a bigger conversation than just hospitality in that there are jobs that exist that aren't um, category driven. So um, if you're a professional athlete, it falls into a category, women's football, men's football, they're, they're categorized because of physical differences. But cooking isn't a sport. No. So your age or gender or race has absolutely nothing to do with it. You could argue that the, the older you get, the better you're gonna be based on like kind of knowledge and stuff. But it seems to be that chefs are young, male and white for the yeah. most part. And why do you think that is? I think that what I'm seeing from people who are getting in contact with me and the young girls and women who are talking to me is that it is a scary, toxic place to be in. And we've, I've, you know, you see toxic workplaces and this happens to men and women where they get, you know, the, the stress of the head chef who's obviously trying to keep their business open. You've got this anxiety of getting stuff wrong. You've got this pressure. You've got, it's a, I've seen people crumble and no one helps and no one talks about it. And it's not an environment where we can all be like, it's all right, come on, chef, why are you being horrible? You can't do that. And I think that is just, as soon as you can witness it, people go, oh, no, I'm out. I don't, and I think as you've got that as a man. You've got that as a white man who's privileged in this industry. You know, if you're getting that as a, as a white man, then being a woman in it as well, you're also getting the side that is the sexual harassment and the belittling because of your gender. And, you know, the, the pressure that you have on your body clock as well, which has been mentioned to me before, like- You, you mean only get, of, of childbirth and things like that? Yeah, like being told that you're probably not gonna get a job after the age of 25 because you're gonna want a kid and no one wants to have someone going on maternity leave. It's like, why, you know, not only are you getting this kind of aggressive toxic side that is in the industry and we all know it's there and it, people are working towards changing it and you know there's the burnt, burnt chef project and there's people doing stuff about that as a woman you're also getting these other bits which is just on top of so when I'm on when I'm talking about my own experiences and that's online and people are saying you're a liar these male people um who are saying that you know, these men who are always questioning my status and criticizing what I'm doing. It's the same people that when I speak openly about my experiences with the misogyny in the industry are saying that I'm wrong and that I'm lying. So I think that there's that, I think that women are aware that this is, that happens and a kind of, you know, you're going into, you're going into um, an industry which is, male dominated so you're kind of you're already like oh this is you know danger zone in some ways <laughs> look at look at what's happened with the past 24 hours with this whole thing and you know me putting out uh, calling out gareth for something that he said and and some of the comments have been horrendous and in the last you know these these are examples i've got examples of what women have commented back saying what they have experienced in the kitchen so I'm going to read them out because they are, it, this is just a few. This is just, some of them can be seen on a post I've already got out and some of them are in private and it is just, it's just gross. It's just horrible. So someone said, I worked in Michigan Star restaurants and only, and only now am I realizing how bad the sexual harassment was, especially recently with a Sarah, sorry, Sarah Everard, the constant little comments, the microaggressions taking their toll. And it's so sad, but weirdly reassuring to hear that it's not only me who's having to deal with it because they're reading, you know, they're reading these comments, seeing it. We've got, as a woman, every single kitchen I have worked in, I've had to prove myself. I've had to act a certain way to make sure that I don't act too emotional or too girly and have to deal with men belittling and sexual harassing me. So there's more, there's more because it's just incredible. Um, working in hospitality since I was a preteen pot wash behind, to behind the bar, there's so much sexual harassment and constant onslaught of degrading behavior towards women and girls. And that's like, you put it in there and you put girls as well, in capitals, girls. This isn't an environment which is a nice place to be. 
even for men, but also very much for women as well. Um, <clears throat> in kitchens, we are undermined, gaslighted and excluded on the sole basis that we're women. I can't even talk about my own experiences because I'd be typing for hours. One of the reasons I left kitchens is because of the male behavior. Um, I've dealt with strict, I've dealt with strict and mean, but some men in the kitchen are just abusive on a different level. The trauma still lives with me. So that's just over a few hours and that's a few of the comments from females who have worked in the industry. So something needs to change. And that is a change for the whole industry. That's for men and for women. That is a change that needs to happen just to not get abuse on the first hand. On the second hand, you need to also be able to accept that women want to be in the kitchen and want to be working, but they're actually, they're just pushed down because everything that they do is belittled and you have to constantly prove yourself. I've had to prove myself for years to just, you know, join in and be accepted into it. And I, I'm, I'm quite like a, a laddish person, if you want to put it, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, get in with the boys and everything, but you still experience it no matter what, you know, no matter how confident you are or anything, it still is there. So someone who isn't as confident or isn't as, you know, just bolshy as I have been and am would get it will get it worse and it will affect them for longer. So it's just something that is in need of change for everyone in the industry. Do you think there's maybe um, two narratives running side by side here with this in the, yes, absolutely everything that you said, hmm. I, you know, it's, it's not even up for debate, but along the side of that, you've also got an industry that celebrates publicly celebrates how tough, how um, stressful. Uh, you look at TV shows, look at Great British Menu. It's built for buzz. If there's no energy, if there's no kind of like shouting or kicking or dropping stuff, which is pressure, which causes anger. Yeah. You know, that's it. Be an angry chef, be, oh, it must be so stressful. People say to me about the restaurant, God, it must be stressful. It's, no, it's not at all. It's fucking mellow. Like, it's really, really chill here. Like, we don't really talk. There's no fridge kicking. The reason I have my own restaurant is because I can't bear that kind of army, like, fucking good. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just, it's just <laughs> and I think anyone that's ever worked for me, even if they hate my guts, would, be, would stand testament to that and say, that is not the environment we've got. But it is something that is, it exists. So I'm not saying that it doesn't exist but it's something that is celebrated within the media of like how kind of stressful and busy and angry, uh, look at Boiling Point. I know it's an old, an old program. Boiling Point celebrates like fucking hell, look at this, it's intense. And that's the drama of it, but it's not the reality of it today for the most part. And I can, I can genuinely like only really speak about my own kitchen. I don't go to anyone else's, but just for mine, it's not like that at all. And I understand that there will be many, many, many women that have experienced negative things that have put them off cooking. I think there's almost a bigger problem that there's much more women that aren't attracted to it from the starting point. Yeah. And that's like, no one's even, you know, no one's even coming in to try. No, no one's coming in to try. No, the CVs that I've had are not female. It's not like people have come and said, oh, that's not for me. It's a bit macho um, or a bit laddie or whatever you want to call it. Women love, you know, everyone loves cooking, everyone loves eating. It's, um, kind of, for me, it's definitely a point of showing love and appreciation to people. That's how I just, you know, it's, it's a joy for me to cook. And, and eating was mainly why I wanted to get into the industry anyway, because I love eating. Um, so women aren't put off by the pressure of kitchens and by stuff like that. It's, it's it, I think for me, it's more that it is this, you know, male dominated area where that it is open to sexual harassment, um, which people are tuned into and know that, you know, that's part of it. Yeah, sorry, I should, I should expand. What I meant by that narrative of the angry kind of highly pressured kitchens is that we're also facing not just that kind of misogynistic sexual harassment route, but alongside that a decline in people interested in hospitality straight across the board. Yeah. There is such a fucking lack of staff. Such a, yeah. There's, like you can't get commies anywhere like that no, is just not, not a thing. Not and um, there's got to be a reason for it because yeah. it's how is it possible that my tv is filled with cookery shows that you are as successful as the, as you are um 
that this podcast is even fucking happening yet we can't get people to work in a kitchen like what's what's happening that people aren't attracted to that and on a yeah on a broader broad scale than the misogyny and harassment yeah. I mean just straight across the board I think it's I think I don't know maybe people just want to have a life because you do have to commit a lot to it you know you do have to dedicate a lot of time to it which um is great when you're in you know when you're in that family environment and everyone's you know a team there but um, you do you know you yourself know you do have to give up quite a bit you don't get to have your birthdays off all the time you don't get to have any you know social events going on a lot of the time when you're when you're in the fine dining of it as well you do get you know you get your holidays but it's um it's a lot of it's just it can be a toxic environment which we are obviously getting shown on tv and I think people might be maybe tuning into it a little bit and actually recognizing that actually we don't you know as much as it's drama and entertainment it's more of a reality on when it's in reality and actually happening to you maybe you don't want that and it's not something that you know I don't know what's putting people off I can't <laughs> It's quite interesting that obviously, you, Michael, you said it's not just about hospitality, is it? And um, this discussion is happening because of something, you know, because of what had been said on the podcast. And I've thought about it a lot because I think I actually work in a very male dominated industry as a journalist. And as a 37 year old who I've, I feel like I've got to a point now where I, you know, I'm good at my job. I know what I'm doing. I'm still at 37, still having comments that are related to my sex. Now, listening to you talking I'm thinking is my tolerance of this fueling that ignorance that's something that's happening in wider society not just within the industry is that women are just going okay and that not everything needs to be called out and not everything needs to be you know um taken as a with you know with an actual pure fuel of misogyny with it but it is something in society that is just happening and it isn't a joke like it, it isn't a joke anymore um because women are being you know you should be allowed to feel the way you feel without someone else saying oh but I was only joking like you should be able to be able to go like actually that isn't you wouldn't say that to somebody else you wouldn't say that to a man you wouldn't be like you dumb blonde so for that example so it's just it's can we keep off the blonde subject please <laughs> <laughs> um, so it isn't always a joke and yeah that's something that in definitely in a wider society is something that people are working on and does is going to change but when you I mean I've had this year to reflect on everything that's ever happened to me when you're in it especially like at work you don't even you don't always notice it and you don't always um recognize it but then when you actually think about it, it's like, oh, that is only happening because I am a woman. No other reason. No other. There's nothing else in there. You can't insult my skills and what I do. You can't insult that I'm working hard. It's just because I have a vagina. Like, cool. Like, great. Thank you so much. So. I don't want this to be like a, a man bashing exercise. Um, I, I really don't. And I do have a question for you, though, Poppy, is um, the when obviously you you posted what you did about um the the podcast and what had been said by Gareth and then the comments that then were directed at Gareth how does that then make you feel from that side because obviously what you're saying is you were you know it was offensive you didn't like it you didn't like how it was said and what was said and then obviously you get negative criticism yourself directed at you that's personal as well it's not even about you're cooking it's you know whatever they want to say so then to see that directed at somebody else because of your post what what are your thoughts on that I didn't see anything too negative towards him it was just more people trying to make him understand why this has happened and why it's being called out I think there was one that might have said to me about his you know his body and that was not unfair and I did you know take that down once I'd seen it but it's more people being upset about, you know, why he's not, why people, not just him, why men aren't understanding. Like, I'm not here to apologise over, like, comments from from a comment he got when I got hundreds. Um, it's, 
yes, that's going to, you know, when you call somebody out for something, it's going to happen. But it's not, he's not getting that on a daily basis because of his gender. He's got it on one instance when he kind of, in my eyes, messed up a little bit and, and said the wrong thing. And it's not, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's different. It weighs itself out a bit differently. This, is, um, this kind of horrible thing that happens when you have, um, let's say a dispute or two sides to any argument that is a particularly polarized discussion. Um, then, and I've been on the receiving end, uh, not the receiving end, you know, if I'm in an, an argument or someone says something bad about me, and then you'll have someone that kind of backs you up, but they say something that doesn't really fit with your rhetoric, you know, like the, the I mean, let's call it what it is. Someone called Gareth a fat pig, right? which is kind of like, that's the opposite of what this conversation should be. Um, and I understand that it was fueled by anger. I understand why it was said, um, but it wasn't acceptable. However, because that comment then kind of goes onto your team, if you like, and I am not making... Yeah, I know, that's, that's the issue. It's not, it's not a reflection of what I'm trying to say. What Gareth said, in, in my eyes, uh, you know, his... He said something negative about you. That is undeniable. I think the main critique was... Um, it was kind of belittling about the food. Um, and I think... I genuinely think, hand on heart, that if you were a guy, he would have probably said this fucking dick or this whatever comes out. And that, you know, he's he knows that he's done wrong there. He's one of my, like, he's a, he's a good friend. He knows that he's done wrong. And he is genuinely one of the kindest men I know. Um, yeah, I think I'd like to add that, obviously, both of us knowing Gareth, that he would never intentionally want to upset anybody. And that's not a defence. It's just to give anyone that doesn't know him a picture. Yeah, I think it's important. I just need to clear up why misogyny is even in the conversation that we're having in this instance when it can be seen as like, okay, some chef didn't know who you were um, and wasn't keen on your food. What's the problem? In this situation, we are putting together, we're both nominated for an award that I went on to win, which is incredible, very proud of myself. Although he obviously has so many more accomplishments to his name and many years in the industry, at this point in time, we were at least peers on a similar level. You know, we were both finalists. And yeah, I did go to win. I, what I don't think is that Gareth was purposely misogynistic in what he said. It's just a small example of an attitude that is reflective of the industry as, as a whole. So the reality is, like, Gareth is a top voice in the industry. And to me, it was hearing someone like I highly respected speak about me negatively with who even is she, some bird, she makes bog standard food. Like rather than celebrating like my success or finding out more about my experiences or even championing what i had achieved as a young woman pushing in a male dominated industry, the first instinct is to go and be dismissive and just disregard it. And in the response from his followers, when you know I've called it out the issue is that as a woman we are constantly told it's just a joke like it's it's just a joke even when we're speaking up on things in the industry that aren't okay and even though this is on a lesser scale of the spectrum um we've got to be in a place where a woman can stand up to a behavior that isn't right whether it's belittlement in the kitchen jokes about her appearance references to her body clock the constant questioning of her credentials as a chef and ultimately this does lead to a position where currently sexual harassment is just accepted in the workplace we've got to champion women in the industry rather than questioning how they got there which is something that always happens um and we've got to be open to hearing why certain behaviors we've been used to for so long just aren't okay anymore and that's why you know this this it's, it's just a joke it's just a joke oh take a joke no one will take a joke anymore this isn't owning up to you know the wider part of the issue that's not an excuse anymore um but then he's got and he said to you like in a kind of um I think the problem is it was an aggressive apology at first like fucking hell why are you making this public and that fuels it um and then you have people on either side, like kind of backing up others, it morphs it into a completely different argument as to what initially happened. Um, 
or at least it takes it off subject a little bit in that like yeah. the misogyny that followed is much more severe than the misogyny that started. Would you agree with that comment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like we're talking about one comment that was made towards Gareth from my side. No, I'm on about, I'm on about from both levels. The, uh, yeah. Like as in what happened, um, what was said from, from male chefs backing up Gareth, the whole kind of like, get a fucking grip. You could see, you can read some of those comments. My girlfriend sent me them and, and it was like, fucking hell, this is gonna go nuts. And some of them just, they may as well just be a fishing rod. I think there was one that said like, women don't fucking belong in a kitchen. And it's clearly just put into the ether to, yeah. um, to antagonize people and to fuel an argument that they're then gonna walk away from and not think about again. Um, which isn't good, but it does kind of like make this side a little bit strange. And what, what I'd like to offer um, as, as a point of conversation is that if we, I think we're in a really great time in life. Mm -hmm. I think lockdown has caused a lot of self-reflection for everyone. Everyone I know is assessing themselves and in a positive way, the Black Lives Matter thing caused a massive change in how people think and how people do things and things that you didn't know, like the unconscious, if you like, or the subconscious, um, negative parts of your life. And the, likewise with the educate your sons, you know, that's, a, that's an important thing as a father, you know. Um, and then the other thing, which is a movement that I'd like to talk about was the, the be kind, the, you know, the Caroline Flack thing. Now, I don't know the details on this. That's an absolute tragedy. Mm -hmm. But just to like gloss over it a little bit, someone was in a bad place, did something bad, potentially or allegedly, and then was heavily criticized for it that drove them to the point of suicide. Is that roughly kind of where we're at? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is that you don't know where that person, no one's perfect. I'm fucking miles away from it and I'm working on it. And that's part of the reason that we're having this conversation, right? No one's perfect, but you don't know where someone's headspace is. And that's not an excuse for misogyny. It's not an excuse for sexism. It's not an excuse for racism. No. But I think the way that, you know, if we can take a positive, the way that we can move it forward, the way that we can actually cause a change isn't by having, um, and this isn't directed at you remotely, Poppy, but isn't by having a global argument saying, men, you fucking dicks, like sort this out. And then the men going, what the fuck are you on about? You know, it just, it gets ridiculous. I think the best way that this can be solved personally and how I would react best to it, if I ever say anything to anyone that's remotely upset that people feel free enough to say, you know what, what you've just said bothers me for whatever reason, because of my race, because of my gender, because you're belittling me or because I'm fat, whatever it is, I don't like it. Please, could you not say it? Um, and then for people to be open enough to receive that criticism, to say, you know what, um, let's just draw a line on it. Women do not like being called birds or our last or our fucking this, that and the other, or er, you know what I mean? All these kind of daft things that are almost a little bit antiquated um, that we can have open conversations towards change. Um, and maybe it is the, the, not necessarily uproar, but the spirit that's come from this is that women maybe don't feel comfortable to speak to people on a kind of one-to-one -one level. And maybe it's a case of like, I don't know, us as, as men doing something that means that people feel comfortable enough to have open conversations about how we are impacting on their lives in whatever way that may be. Of course, and that's, I mean, it, it, that's why we're here today because I had to do, I had to call him out publicly for us to have this conversation. And hopefully this shows that the, the young women who are following me, who send me messages saying, thank you so much for bringing this to you know my attention because I didn't even know this could be something that I can say. I have to now openly keep saying these things because otherwise they won't know they can do that. So I have to bring it out publicly for people to realize that they can do that privately. And as much as you don't want it to be a you know, an outroar and everything. And it, unfortunately it does happen. And if, if it hadn't have been Gareth saying something, it probably would have been somebody else and I would have done exactly the same thing because, you know, I'm not with these people personally. So it's, I feel now that I've got this platform and I have to use it for something that I believe in and I've got a voice that wouldn't, you know, I weirdly have a voice on social media, which is odd. I need to use that for, for a good, for a good reason. And that is definitely so that younger 
aspiring chefs, men, women have confidence if they don't feel like something's right, can bring it up. Exactly like you said, like in in a scenario when it's happening to them in person. I um, I agree with that completely. Um, I think that from my own experiences of my own sexism, my own levels of misogyny, um, and my own conditioning, yeah. that for like male chefs listening, I think it's important to say that, you know, you think you're a certain way, your own conditioning isn't your fault. You know, it, it's your fault, it's your responsibility to change, but it's not your fault for how you are today. So you don't need to particularly, I used to take criticism over anything like this, honestly, like a fucking bull. I would just go for it. And, and I'm, a, I'm a father now, a much different person. I carry you and I fell out for it, just right? Mm. Remember, like, <laughs> I don't know what it's about, but honestly, like anyone says anything about me or anything negative, I would just boom, boom, boom. Because I took it so personally, so offensive, but it was like, I was in an environment that I wasn't used to. And, you know, like I said, my own conditioning wasn't my fault. So I just presumed that everything that I did was right. Turns out I was fucking miles off. <laughs> but like, but I think, I think that's fair for everyone. And it's such, um, you know, for, for feminism to exist, it's such a positive thing. There's a lot of positive traits within feminism for men in general, you know, we will be, this will be a better society. No one loses, man. Like yeah. the only people that lose are people at the top of the power scale. You know, the people in parliament, the people that fucking run the world, that will change. But day to day people, me, you, fucking whoever on the street, nothing changes for a negative. Everything's just a positive and it's not personal. It's not your fault. You can just fix it. It yeah, is. It's, it's absolutely fine to make a mistake. I think it's when people don't then learn from it or then don't listen to it. That is when there starts to be a bit of a, you know, more of an issue. Whereas like everyone has made a bloody mistake. I've made fucking loads of mistakes, but I'm willing to own up to them and go, yeah, you know what? At the beginning of my career and everything, I just accepted everything, which is a mistake I've made. I've fully aware that I was enabling it in some ways and just being like, yeah, it's funny. It's fine. Yeah, I'm one of you. Blah, blah, blah. When really I should have gone, guys, come on, fucking hell, please give me a fucking break. You know, it could have been done a lot earlier, but you know, here we are, and here I'm just trying, just you know, just trying to make people aware that it's something that is happening and something that people are changing, which is great. One thing I would like to say is like, um, with my success that I've had so far, like, just I haven't had anybody in the industry or people that I've worked with before and think really come through and be like well done like I know that sounds stupid but I am sat here with a book deal from Bloomsbury one of the biggest publishers you know that I know of in the UK who approached me for a book deal I'm sat here with brand deals with KitchenAid and making more money than I've ever it sounds it sound really like big-headed of me but like I'm sat here you know being successful and getting my food shown and seen by millions of people and I'm still having to fight for any kind of respect with it. For, with, with that, do you mean by people that are kind of close to you or people that you look up to or um, people that you encounter? A bit of everything, really. Um, especially, I think it's within, within the industry more. I'm still getting, you know, ridiculed by chefs, whether it's people I know or don't know or have never heard of, or I'm still getting belittled because of the success that I've had. But then I also get a little because I've worked for 10 years in the industry already and people still say, you're not a fucking real chef. And it's like, I, there's nowhere for me to win here. So I'm just gonna keep pushing for a bit more of an equality so that someone else behind me who will be successful and will smash it has an opportunity to feel the respect that they deserve. Well then on behalf uh, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, no. me, be the first. Open your ears, Poppy. Open your ears. <laughs> to congratulate you. No, it's an it's an amazing thing. And it's um do you know what? In in a year where like everything's been a bit shit, and mm. hospitality in particular is a field that is notoriously difficult to make money in anywhere to be successful in, notoriously difficult. To polish your ego, it's a piece of piss. Anyone can make food look good, put it on the plate. 
Well, it is. It, like, to be sought after in that is easy. You know, that's the easy bit. But to be successful is the difficult bit. And that's irrespective of age, gender, or the product that you're doing. Um, so congratulations. That's a, an incredible success story. Um, and this is kind of a bit of a compliment sandwich. But maybe, um, maybe the lack of congratulations is specific to people being just generally a bit angry that they're not making any money themselves, that they're not working. And there's like, you know, I think it's, it's okay to be jealous, right? And it's okay to, these emotions, you can't control your emotions. Um, if you feel jealousy, you feel jealousy. How you portray that is a completely different thing. Do you know what? Um, I hate confrontation and drama. Like I will shy away from it until I absolutely have to be involved in it. So I think, you know, what you've what you've done um, over the past year and what you say to people, like, you know, well done, because a lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to put themselves out there. But I think, as Michael has said through this podcast, if no one talks about it, no one tells you how are you, you know, you then you don't know. And it is so important to create an environment where people can go, actually, men or women, I don't like that. Yeah. Because of this reason. And then, you know, like you said, everyone makes mistakes. And then you have the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, I didn't realise. I won't do that again. I am in no way trying to, like, diminish chefs diminish gareth i'm not trying to bash him i have no personal like you know hate to what there's nothing it's just highlighting an issue that is bigger than this and that comment and everything it's it's that's the only thing that i'm trying to do here just so that people can see that you know things are changing things are going to change and and there are so many incredible men in this industry including yourself including gareth including all these people you see compliments everywhere now so it's not in any way like we said for man bashing it's not like uh me coming up against everybody ever i just want to bring it to a conversation and an awareness and if this and if this post hadn't happened we probably wouldn't be having this conversation so i agree with that no we definitely wouldn't be having this conversation so that's a nice thing poppy um i want to talk about another struggle yeah. And that's the struggle that you and I both face. And that's having an apostrophe in your surname and filling oh in. Oh, my God. No one knows the fucking troubles that we go through. <laughs> it's it's in it. And then it comes up, ambersand hashtag minus minus plus 7195. Yeah. No one knows what an apostrophe is, right? <laughs> no one. And also trying to just tell somebody your name and remember that it's an apostrophe. I always say like an exclamation mark because I get my words mixed up all the time. They're like what? And I'm like, oh, what is it? Com apostrophe. It's, I, it's ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. Why is it a thing? And why can't you put it in anywhere? I don't understand. People have apostrophes in their name. Yeah, it's on the hyphen, wherever you want. Flipping a hyphen at any point in your name. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yes. Apparently, um, and I don't know how much validity is in this, but even if it's false, let's just go with it because it sounds cool. Um, apparently, I'm Obviously, it's Irish, um, but the apostrophe, as opposed to not apostrophe, was to do with a civil war. And if you're on the side of the king, you were an apostrophe. Oh, well, look at yeah, that. Yes, so if there's an O'Toole that doesn't have the apostrophe, they are fucking enemy. And if you get yourself a bow and arrow and a chainmail suit, <laughs> get them. <laughs> I didn't know that at all. I just thought. I mean, it, it might like, be bullshit. I just read it once. It was just willy nilly. Just the only thing I've read that and Roger Redhart. <laughs> <laughs> um, Poppy, what about food? Like, yeah. cause we're chefs in that, and this is on the staff canteen, and we haven't mentioned yeah. it. I know. It's <laughs> <laughs> what has been? You're not allowed to say your own food or anything that you've made. What's been the best thing that you've eaten in the last twelve months out in lockdown times? You know what I mean. Ah, um, Sorry, uh, the time, but I am gonna have to rush you. Oh my god, oh my god, um, where well, I haven't been anywhere. Oh my god, I've literally been to one place. Um, Poppy, what about because you try other people's recipes and things, don't you? I know I've seen on your, your feed and you watch how they do things and then you do them. Is there any of those that you've been like, I, I've never had that before, but it's actually amazing? Well, yeah, yeah, someone's told me to put banana on pizza, so I thought, fuck it, I'll give it a go, mm. right. With tuna okay. and banana, 
unbelievable. Really? Yeah, so I am like a pizza purist. I think the only flavor of pizza in the world is pepperoni. And if you ask a kid to draw a pizza, that's what it looks like. So don't fuck <laughs> it. I don't want any chicken on it. I don't want any ham. I don't want any pineapple. <laughs> and, uh, I was working in London years ago. I was like 21. And a friend of mine will probably be listening, Barry, was like, fucking tuna on a pizza, mate. Tuna and banana. I was like, you're a pig. You're a pig. <laughs> that's my initial thought yeah but if you think about it like i know people don't really agree with the ham and pineapple thing but there is an idea with the kind of savory sweet and sour elements of that that it kind of does exactly the same thing tuna in brine is no different to a salted ham banana is comparable to a pineapple but not as acidic like so the two like kind of work really well together at the same time we did banana and sea urchin pizzas here with garlic no tomato that's, I think that's what my issue was. It was just cheese, tomato and banana. And it was a bit like, mm, no, I wasn't sure. But I think maybe there's a contrasting kind of element to it. It might I mean, It's not on my menu. You know what I mean? I'm not that big an advocate for it. I haven't had it in about 10 years, but it was, it was pretty good. Like, <laughs> I think it's not good. It's just not shit and it should be shit. Yeah, that's the surprise element of it, that it's not as bad as it sounds. I'll, I'll have a go with tuna. We'll see what it's like. I'll do a post. No, I, don't, I don't want that to be the only thing that I said to you. You should read <laughs> Tuna and Banana Pizza. You'll love it. <laughs> That's it. That's the second book. <laughs> <laughs> Poppy, my, like final question for you. Is, um, obviously, your life has changed completely in 12 months and you won't, won't be going back to what you left at 12 months ago. So are you looking forward to that kind of when everything's reopening in your new, complete new chapter? Yeah, I am. I am. I think it's going to be weird because the initial thought of mine is like, oh, I'll be back in kitchens. But then I I don't know if that's going to happen anymore. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm still unsure of what I want to do next. What's the next thing now? Um, so excited for the book that's coming out in September. I'm so excited for other conversations that are happening with, you know, other people and I want to you know get into doing pop-ups I still want to be having that buzz of being in the kitchen I still want to be able to show off my professional side and show off that you know I can clean down really well and get the mop out and that like I I still enjoy all of that and I still want to be able to do it but I think I need to try and find a balance where I can still do this kind of more public eye social media fit into it and it's just I don't know where it's going to go but I'm really excited I think the, the social media thing and, and cooking on social media platforms, it almost feels like it's just TV now, isn't it? Like that's the new TV. I don't, um, because, because of my house, it's like essentially made of lead and I don't have like normal TV schedules in it. Um, so I just watch things <laughs> on demand and stuff. Um, so I watch TV and I think most people watch TV pretty much whatever they want, whenever they want. Hmm. And that same thing can be accessed on your mobile device, on your computer, whatever. So it's very difficult to, one, like criticize someone for spending too much time watching things on their phone or their iPad, because that's the same as like in the 70s, people saying you'll get square eyes if you stare at that thing too long. It's exactly the same thing. And maybe just the day, I mean, your viewing figures, you'd like a TV show would be happy with that. Yeah, like, really over year, that. I've had like 10 million, 100 million views over a year like that's how many people have viewed my content like it is it's it's unbelievable how big this can be and how much it's going to change that's what I think that's why that I think that's why people in the industry do need to look at social media more and be a little bit less uh, and worried about dipping their toes in it because it's a platform if you embrace it with positive view of like this can change your life in a lot of ways like and just being able to see it positively in a case that you're being able to showcase your love passion and um you know your skills as a chef um and being able to showcase that to possibly hundreds of you know millions or even hundreds of people if that was in a restaurant it would be like oh this is you know the best restaurant in the world if you were getting this sort of traction to it you can just do that online and it's a phenomenal power that you can have on there. It's incredible the outreach that you can get. And I think people shouldn't be scared of it. Um, yeah, there is nasty parts of it. And we all know that. And, you know, that's inevitable. But there's nasty parts of going on telly. You're still going to get... Oh, the fucking horrendous parts of that. Absolutely ruined on Twitter. Like, and ruined by, pe you know, people are still going to slag you off when you go back into work and someone, you know, that's still going to happen. But mm. 
it should be it should be something that we're trying to embrace in the industry i think because you know there's so many up and coming food people food you know food creators on different platforms that we you know we can look at we can look at and take notes from and be like oh okay this is what people are enjoying you know it's, it can all be built into still coming in back into like this proper professional background but having a little look at what other people are doing is never never a bad thing and it, it, it's just trying to break down a bit of the elitism I suppose as well with it you know you kind of some people are put off by going into some restaurants because of you know there is that kind of fancy elitism to it sometimes in some places and some of the generations that I've been able to reach being online probably would never have the money or never be able to afford or never want to go into it because they haven't really seen how to make food anyway so they're not, not appreciating it so mm. trying to bring a bit you know we can all look at it and try and bring a bit of it's got a bit of a kind of grassroots feel to it hasn't it? yeah you know like I think it's it's important to invest in that and investment doesn't necessarily need to be financial and investment can be just with you know knowledge um but it it's interesting for me because uh, you know I have a restaurant now I don't want to work forever you know, I'll just throw that out there. Um, I have a son, I don't know what he wants to do with his life, whether he wants to be a fucking ballet dancer or whatever. Um, sorry, I said that. I wanted to give a story. I know, so this is going off. <laughs> I thought about this, um, about doing this podcast loads, like since we've agreed now, I thought, shit, I'm up for scrutiny here. Like this could go really badly. And I just examined that kind of fear and stuff. So I had like within me, like this kind of back pocket ammo of I'm not an asshole. You know, <laughs> this is where I came from. Um, and I am an arsehole, so it didn't work. But um, <laughs> like, so I, like I said, I grew up, I touched on it a little bit um, in a household where my mother was the, the breadwinner, the money earner. And um, everything was kind of fine. It was kind of just the great unspoken. And then when I reached the age of 11, I took an interest in the arts and I started ballet and I did ballet for like seven years. And my dad is working class Teesside steel workers. It went down like a fucking lead balloon. <laughs> um, and when I was at like the age of 18, I had a, a, a Royal Ballet Scholarship. And um, actually, Ashley Palmer, what's his son's doing this at the moment? It looks fucking amazing. I think he's going to clean up. But um, yeah, and, and everything was going so, so well. And I was like really happy. And um, it was absolutely nothing to do with my sexuality at all. It was quite the opposite. I kind of pretty much got into it because there was girls there and I was like, oh my God, there's girls. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and my mum was doing the ironing and she's like, Put, we've all got piles. And she's ironing these tights and my dad's putting them away. And my dad's putting them in the piles and my dad puts these tights in my mum's piles and my mum said, oh, they're not mine, they're all Michael's. And my dad, Threw the tights down, uh, threw the tights down, grabbed his wallet, went to the pub where my mate worked, had a couple of pints, and gave him the house key when he was drunk and said to go around and knock me out to sort my head out. Um, yeah, and I think that's the kind of thing. And now, like, now I'm a chef and I'm successful, and you know, all these things happen, and he doesn't give a shit. You know, he's not worried about that anymore because, well, at least he's not gay. And I mean that in the most sincere way possible. That's like the viewpoint, I think, from. Uh, from the conditioning, from the from growing up in a northern town, you don't know. I mean, I knew that that was fucking wrong. I'm going to be honest, um, yeah. but but people are subject to things that are inherently male in the north and inherently female, and that kind of doctrine doesn't get challenged until you do something fucking wrong or until you say something wrong. Um, and yeah, you can just slide that story in if you want, Cara. About <laughs> What, what, how, when did you discover that food was the way you're going to go? Because I know you said about going to uni and everything, but like you seem to have jumped through a few different um, options. Oh my God, I've been to a... <laughs> when I, um, so it was ultimately only ever ballet until I was like 18, 17, 18. And at 17, 18, I was still like kind of a laddie lad. Yeah. Um, really laddie actually, like blue WKD fucking lad. I just okay. happened to do ballet. Great drink with a straw. My Cheeky vimp to all the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I went to college. I did dance at college. And I also simultaneously played football. Yeah. And I was getting like a little bit of stick for like 
hamstrings and calves and you know just tightening your muscles by playing football and I was like oh my god but then there's like booze and girls and football <laughs> and this this regime that's really strict um so I want to do that one and ultimately who's going to get a job as a fucking dancer it's so like when we talk about elitism there is a few jobs going yeah. there and even if you're successful it's not particularly well paid so it's not a great okay. route and it costs a fuckload to get there and, and you learn at the age of like in your mid-20s you can't do it anymore yeah, that's, like you're done, that's it yeah Exactly. Or open a dance school. And um, yes, I thought I can't do that. And I was a bit sick of the whole fucking thing. So I was like, right, okay, just pick a job. So I picked uh, aerospace. Well, I did hairdressing for a week and it didn't pay well. Stephen was... <laughs> <laughs> My dad was buzzing. Dad, I'm not going to be a ballet dancer. I'm going to be a... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then, so I went to uni and then at that point, when I did engineer, aerospace engineering at uni, then I was like, I like cooking. And um, it wasn't particularly that I liked high end. Mm -hmm. I, just, I think I was forced into high end and I'm, I'm glad of where I'm at, I wouldn't change it. But um, I got into it because I almost felt I needed to apologize for leaving university. I've got to legitimize this by doing it at a top level. Yeah, if yeah, that yeah. makes any sense. Like yeah. if I leave here and go and work at Frankie and Benny's, you might me, mm -hmm. but at least if I say, well, it's a country house hotel, it's fine. You know, I can be like, I don't know, whoever. I didn't know any chefs at the time. Michelle Rue, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's how I, I kind of got into it. What about yourself? Uh, just through eating. Like I said, like I was my... <laughs> <laughs> Staring at it. Where did this come from? Like, it was just... I absolutely love eating. And I knew that if I was in the kitchen, I could eat whilst I cook. That was my excuse was like, oh, I'll help. Arr. So um, so that was where it came from. And also I am so unacademic. Like I am not someone who can put pen to paper. I'm not someone who can read very well. Like I'm not that person. So school was like, uh -uh, no, I'm there to mess around. And then, um, like literally failed like catering, like literally failed the things that I'm good at. I failed them because I just don't have the, I don't have the attention span to sit and do something. So, so yeah, it was always just, it was the one thing that I was always going to do. I think I was just destined to um, eat my way through cooking. So that was, you know, that was for me. And that was where I learned that actually I'm not that thick. I can do things practically. That's how I learn, but I just need to, you know, get in the kitchen to do it so I was I, I was just constantly working so when I was 15 I had two jobs 16 had three jobs like I was just wanting to be in a work environment and constantly working from there so then when I saw this apprenticeship come up in Birmingham for Penals and I was like well I've been just been working in pubs like let's just go for it and I was like managed to get get in there and that's when I just realized how much I loved it like I just love I love being able to not just stick to home cooking as well like I know that's what I've gone back into sort of with what I do now but being able to see how creative and how crazy things can get like it's an expression of any kind of creativeness and art that you kind of have inside you you can express that in food mm -hmm. which is incredible I think I think it's amazing that people can do that and it's kind of a bit of a it's a bit of a show you can show off your personality on a plate which is great and that's why I just enjoyed it because I was it was a, a place that I could I can put into context my passions, whereas pen and paper, I uh -uh, can't do that. There's no, I couldn't, I can hardly form a sentence, let alone try and write something. So being able to put it on a plate was just, it's just great for me. It's just where I enjoy it. And then I can eat it after, which is even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just say, um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. One for reaching out, I think like, you know, life's better for it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and Cara, again, thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me as well. I really appreciate it. And um, I it just, it's actually just incredible that I've been able to speak to you because like, you're like, like, just an, I just can't speak to you like an icon. You're incredible. I love you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. That's incredibly kind. Thanks, Cara. No, thank you both very much. And thank you both for being so uh, open and honest because I think it was definitely a conversation that we needed to have. So thank you both for doing the podcast um, and I will speak to you both soon. Bye.
Bye. We hope you enjoy listening to Grilled as much as we enjoy recording it. If you want to catch up on past episodes, they are all available now. Just search for Grilled by the Staff Canteen where you normally get your podcasts. And if you want to help us keep bringing you the content you love, you can contribute from as little as £1. Just head to thestaffcanteen.com to find out how. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.